You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Susan Carruthers on with me to talk about her brand new book, Dear John, Love and Loyalty in Wartime America. And This is such an intriguing book to me, uh, Susan. When when I saw the email come across from your publisher, um, I, I, I kind of looked askew at it and and thought, well, I, this, this sounds like... Um, a really interesting topic that that we don't hear people talk about and and uh you know in reading uh the the arc that i got um i was i was not uh disappointed at all i I love this book and i think that we all can learn something from it uh welcome to the show today well thanks hank and thank you so much for that very warm endorsement of my book and (laughs) (laughs) it is indeed an intriguing topic and it is and what I would say perhaps my, my own take on on your opening gambit would be to say that it, it's not a story that we read very much about. No. There, there are plenty of oral stories, as, as my book explores, about Dear John letters and, and the women who, who write and send them. But I was quite puzzled, really, when I, I first had the idea that I wanted to explore and write about the topic, that, that a, a cultural trope that is so prominent and has been for so many decades now should not have attracted any previous author was um, both perplexing but also pleasing since I got to write my book. I, I love it. Um, Susan, th- there's so much for us to talk about in uh, with this book, but before we do, we begin each show with the same question. And and we have to to get this out of the way before we can move on. That question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Hmm, that's that's a tricky one, uh, but it would go back a very long way to to early in my childhood. So I was lucky to have a parents, but particularly a mother who just loved stories, loved books and reading to us. Uh, I have a sister who's two years older than I am. And so from my very, very earliest years, um, probably months, not even years, I was constantly being told stories. Um, My mother was a great storyteller herself, and she also loved reading to me and my sister. And and then I would pester my sister to to read me stories ad nausea, which drove her crazy (laughs) because she learned to read when she was two and a half, which she hasn't let me forget that she was much younger than I was (laughs) when when I first learned to to read. Um, but, But when we wouldn't not Sisters can very... be the worst, can't they? <laughs> well, and the best, <laughs> uh, to her credit. Course, she is a, a fabulous sister. Um, and, and my mother actually was also literally my first primary school teacher. So when I was five years old and I went to school for the first time, my teacher was Mrs. Carruthers, a.k.a. my mum. So so she really instilled in, in both of us a, a lifelong love of of literature and of storytelling. And, and when my sister and I were probably, oh, I might have been seven and she might have been nine or so, we actually started writing stories together. Um, so I think we had we had seen something on a children's program on the BBC about the Bronte sisters and those tiny little miniature books, the Gondor saga that they wrote um, on, on pieces of paper out the size of a match box and and we we started writing these tiny little books and stories and we'd illustrate them and I I don't know if I consciously thought I want to be a writer when I'm grown up but I just have always loved writing. So taking that that kind of uh, innate desire to do that um, I, I hear people that 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 tell me stories of of having these early feelings that, you know, I, I want to be a storyteller. I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, and invariably life has a tendency to, 
um, pop up and, uh, you know, we, we start families, we start working real jobs and we have bills to pay and, and all of that. But for somehow writing and storytelling has a way of coming back around into our lives. What was that, uh, that moment for you where, where you, you know, knew that you had a story to tell and, uh, and, and that, that this story needed to be seen by other people? Hmm. Well, I, I guess I'm incredibly fortunate because I am paid to do the thing that I, I love better sure, than sure. pretty much anything else in, in, in the world. So uh, as an academic, I, I'm really fortunate. I get to research and write on topics that fascinate me. I get to talk about these same things with my students and um, I I get to be a writer and a teacher and I get paid a, a pretty good salary <laughs> to, to do these incredibly rewarding and, and exciting and fun things. So if, for me, there's never been any any conflict between the call of, of, of sort of the workplace and the, the need to earn a crust and my desire to write. I, I just think I have the best job in the world. And so I'm very, very lucky in that regard. And, and I guess one of the things perhaps that, that, that creates only a modest amount of tension is that I think often the way in which academics are taught to write and train one another to write as, as students, but particularly as graduate students, um, can be a little bit um, obstructive of good storytelling. And, and so that's something that more and more, I mean, I've now been um, an academic um, in university settings and in both the US and the UK for 30 years to, to my ongoing amazement. <laughs> and, and, and I think over those years, it's become more and more important to me to, to tell stories and to craft narratives that, that speak to as wide a possi as possible an audience. So not just writing books for other academics, which alas is, is what we mostly keep uh, reinforcing amongst graduate students. That's what you have to do, write a dissertation, turn it into your first book. And of course, as soon as publishers get hold of academic manuscripts, mostly what they want to do is strip out all of that academic apparatus that we have kept training young scholars to, to add in the literature review and all of that stuff that nobody really wants to read a literature review. So that that's sort of the arc of, of my story, I guess, that I, I've become much more self-consciously um, and avowedly committed to writing books that people way beyond the academy, I, I hope, will read and enjoy. In um, a as an academic who um, who spends time with with physical students in in, you know, one on one or, or in a group setting, um, but, you know, physically in, in the presence of other people. Um, mm. when, when you have a curriculum that you're teaching um, there, that is uh, a, a very different delivery method um, than writing a book that about an historical topic that you are going to disseminate this information on this topic that you, um, you know, that, that you have, uh, you know, hit upon that, that is going to, um, you know, resonate with with a lot of people that mm. what, what's the difference? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to say all that to, to get to a question. What's the difference mm. in communicating um, the things that you want to get across in a book like Dear John, uh, as opposed to taking the same topic maybe and teaching it to, you know, an actual group of people that are sitting in front of you? Um, what's the difference in in teaching, you know, physically uh, people and writing something that will then go to a much broader audience that you may never see? Mm. Well, that's a really intriguing question. Um, and I don't know if I can do it justice in a, in a very <laughs> short, <laughs> impromptu answer. And, uh, you, you, it, was, you it, are, was, it was literally an impromptu question <laughs> that just came to me. So, you know, I'm, I like I'm, I like those. That's much better than the kind that are all prescripted and <laughs> and and will be asked. And and regardless of of the response, the, there's no engagement with, with the response. I, um, so, I, well, one of the the wonderful things actually, right 
now is that I can teach. Actually, you talked about sort of physical students and, and, and there we are in an actual real classroom, which is so nice after you know this time last year, everything here in Britain was was online only and and a very long period of time it felt like went by and there was no face to face interaction with students. So I, I'm just trying to think about what the difference is. I mean, one of the things that's, that's that's really fortunate about my job and teaching, I guess, in a university college setting as opposed to a, a, a classroom, as a school classroom, is that I get to devise the curriculum. Um, sure. I'm not having to teach what you know a, a state or a, some governmental institution has, has laid down as the prescribed curriculum. So in some ways, there's maybe not such a, a great difference in as much as, you know, I can think through when I'm putting together, um, we call courses modules here in the UK for some reason, but I, I get to devise my own modules and I get to decide, well, what are the themes? How do I want to sequence this? So in some ways, it's quite a lot like thinking about how I would outline a book or the the, the arc of, of a narrative that you get to decide how you introduce material, what, what's the best way to, to sort of layer different themes so that you lead students towards an ever greater, um, not just body of knowledge, but, but set of insights in, into that material. Um, and you get to deliver lectures where you, and also seminar sessions in which you know, one of the nice things about being a historian is that you can expose students to primary source material. And that's something I, I'm actually doing right now in the course that I'm teaching. So some of the material that I mined from various archives for the Dear John book, I'm now having my students look at. I haven't assigned them the book because <laughs> that, that, that can go badly. Um, I, I, I find sometimes assigning oneself, if, if it seems to be um, mandatory to, to read the professor as well as be in her presence for, for some hours a week. Uh, but it, it is really great when you can, you can see how students respond to material. Right. And, and sometimes they, they respond in ways that are rather different from the sorts of meanings and messages that you extracted from primary sources. What, what, Susan, what uh, what was it about history that initially drew you in? Um, you know, writing can be one thing. Um, uh, teaching, communicating with with people can can be a facet of that or, or or another thing altogether. But what was it about history specifically that intrigued you personally? And then what was it that that uh, that really brought you to wanting to to share that with other people? You know, there's one thing to be a um, to to kind of be a history buff. And it's another thing to um, to want to put together curricula and, and to to communicate these things with other people. Hmm. Well, I think my my fascination with history and my lifelong affinity with stories and, and storytelling go absolutely hand in hand that there's this sort of um, fathom, well, unfathomable, that's not the word I want, but sort of, a, a, you know, a bottomless well of human experience that can be tapped as, as a historian. I, I guess, you know, this part of me, like I'm sure many writers of, of, of works of historical nonfiction that wonders if I have a novel in me, um, might I try my hand at fiction writing one day? And then there's another piece of me that's just also very apprehensive about my stunted imagination. <laughs> Could I really dream up stories that weren't somehow or other just thinly veiled versions of my own life or, or friends, family members' lives? And, and that makes me very trepidatious. Whereas with, with history, I go go to archives and I try to visit as many different archives as possible and and find stories like in the, the Dear John book that in some cases have been told before, but often have been told before um, in a very flimsy way that's simply a sort of recycling of, of stories, quite possibly apocryphal ones, without really digging any deeper on the part of, of authors who who just very in, in rather superficial ways kept invoking the same sort of stale repertoire of of rehearsed dear john stories so to me that that's it's a rather voyeuristic thrill perhaps that you you get to go to to places where there are traces of people's lives and in the case of this book in particular very intimate 
portions of their lives. So I'm dealing with romantic relationships in wartime, um, how they're sustained or, or more particularly how they fail to be sustained under the corrosive pressures of, of war. And, and I get to retrieve those things that very often haven't really been brought to light before. And, and that's a, a, an incredible privilege. Uh, I'm endlessly grateful to, to people who leave their own diaries, letters, unpublished memoirs to archives dotted around the country and in some cases perhaps their offspring who, who stumbled upon mouldering packages of, of papers decades after a parent's death and, and then thought to, to give them to places like the, the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress or other of the archives I used. So I think it's a phenomenal um, privilege, I keep saying that word, but I, I'm struggling to come up with, with, with better synonyms. Um, I guess as a writer, I, where is my, th my thesaurus when I need it? Um, that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm able to, to go and uncover these stories. And I, I, I think I, I found some very wonderful ones in the book, like the, the sort of single narrative that I, I keep coming back to at different chapters of, of Dear John about a young woman from Newark, New Jersey, which was my adoptive hometown for a, a decade or so. Um, a, a story that's fleetingly been told elsewhere, but which which I returned to and tried to retell, uh, perhaps from a rather more sympathetic point of view to its female protagonist. Susan, looking at your uh, your catalog of work, um, Dear John, The Good Occupation, The Media at War, Cold War Captives, Winning Hearts and Minds, um, and other work that you've done, there there is a connective thread that runs through all of these works um, where you seem to be fascinated with, um, you know, society at, at war and in conflict with um, with others and, and with ourselves by, by extension. Um, what is it about, uh, you know, and, and with Dear John, we're, we're going to talk in just a moment about the, the specific thing um, that kind of it, it runs across these, um, uh, all of these events and historical pieces that, um, you know, how we deal with with war and the people that are left behind and then, you know, uh, all, all of these sorts of things. But what is it about conflict um that that you think uh is um is, is fertile ground to to harvest these stories hmm. well that's a, another really really good question uh, so i i've been writing about war for my my whole career and and i got hooked on on thinking about war stories and how they work and how they're told um, even before I started contributing my my own stock of, of war and post-war stories to to that that repertoire uh, ever since I was an undergraduate student and I, I took a course on propaganda in World War II which was was very eye-opening and and exposed me to different ways of of thinking than the other components of my undergraduate degree um, I, I think more broadly, though, what I would say is is that war war is is perhaps a particularly compelling place that I keep going back to because in 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 some ways or many ways it it intensifies phenomena, processes, patterns that are evident in in everyday life and and amongst civilians and not just those in uniform and their loved ones and and it's precisely that interplay between the quotidian things that we're all familiar with universal stuff of, of, of human life and the way in which war often sort of operates as a, a sort of force multiplier of human experience and, and introduces all sorts of pressures, tensions, intensifications of human feeling and, and the interactions between, between people that I think make it for me a, a very compelling, dramatic place to go in, in search of stories. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. Bearded bad boy Barber Knox refers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound Waylon. Knox doesn't tolerate drama even when it comes in the form of a stranded runaway bride. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. 
she was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old fashioned way with fist and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, Tina leaves her with something unexpected. The niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home, with an 11-year-old going on 30 to take care of. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high-maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones. But since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of her jam. And just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful, solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author, Lucy Score. An Innocent Client, the first book in the Joe Dillard legal thriller series. A preacher is found brutally murdered in a Tennessee motel room. A beautiful, mysterious young girl is accused. In this best-selling debut, criminal defense lawyer Joe Dillard has become jaded over the years as he's tried to balance his career against his conscience. Savvy but cynical, Dillard wants to quit doing criminal defense, but he can't resist the chance to represent someone who might actually be innocent. His drug-addicted sister has just been released from prison, and his mother is succumbing to Alzheimer's. But Dillard's commitment to the case never wavers despite the personal troubles and professional demands that threaten to destroy him. Chosen by BookBub readers as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time, get started on this great series with an innocent client where it all started. Read for free with Kindle Unlimited or buy it in paperback or audiobook. An Innocent Client by Scott Pratt. So, Susan, the, the topic of Dear John letters is, is something that we have seen in in pop culture, in movies, and in, in, in books. And they're always used to um, to kind of amp up the, the feeling of heartbreak, you know, especially someone that's in the trenches. And, you know, the, the, they're holding on to the this idea, this feeling of a of, of a connection back to home that uh, that then gets severed and and you know we we've seen story after story of the, the soldier who just you know goes off the deep end because their their last thing that they're holding on to for normalcy is is gone. Um, how did you begin to to kind of start looking into this phenomenon and what was it that initially intrigued you? Well, you're quite right that the Dear John motif in popular culture is very durable, very persistent, and, and tends to be very um, sort of one tone in, in exactly the way that, that, that you characterized it there, that, that the poor young man far from home who is stricken to receive this um, emissary of, of abandonment and, and often betrayal as well, because the sort of archetypal, uh, dear John, doesn't just announce that the relationship is ended, but that the sender has also transferred her affections elsewhere. And almost invariably, our empathy is, is trained exclusively on the young man at this moment of, of emotional crisis and the cruelty of, of the woman who, who presumed to do that to him. Um, and I, of course, in the book, set out to try to complicate that narrative and, and uh, suggest that, that we need to be much more attentive to the many dynamics in play in, in wartime relationships and, and the many, many things that make them very hard to sustain often. So I, I got to this topic really through my previous book, which was about occupation soldiers, uh, American occupation soldiers in the many places they went after World War II, from Germany to to Japan and, and other sites that are less well remembered as well. And in pursuit of, of, of that book and that story, I read hundreds of correspondences between occupation soldiers and their loved ones back home. And, and although it wasn't the the sort of holy grail of, of that research quest was was not to explore the texture of romantic intimacy between separated loved ones. Um, I was just intrigued by the candor with which many men and women were were writing to one another. This often um, 
at least while military censorship was still firmly in place, with the, the very unmistakable knowledge on the part of at least the man in uniform that someone else was reading his letters um, in the shape of, very often of his commanding officer. And, and the fact that, that men and women were so uh, still, despite knowing that their, their correspondence was really not in any way private or sacrosanct, would freely share their anxieties about spousal infidelity, about the durability of their love, all the, the pressures that were making it perhaps fray ever more, more seriously the longer they were apart. This was just very rich material to me. And, and that was really what, what embedded the idea that at, at some point, not too far down the line, I, I wanted to make um, wartime intimacy the topic of my next book. And, and that's what I did. And, and I use the Dear John letter as, as a way into exploring this very, very um, sort of densely textured terrain of wartime relationships and oftentimes their failure. Susan, a, a book like this intrigues me on, on so many different levels. Um, but as I'm looking at it, um, I'm I, I wonder uh, when you're laying out a book like this, do you begin with what you believe kind of will be the narrative um, structure of the book and then, you know, find anecdotes and, and find uh, stories that, that kind of fill in the perceived narrative? Or, you know, do you begin with uh, just a, a completely blank slate and start going through all of these stories and then kind of see where the narrative is. Uh, how, how do you approach the structure of a book like this? Mm. Well, in, in this particular case, I I did 98% of, of the research, I would say, before I sat down and, and wrote anything, which isn't perhaps quite how I've I've approached all of my books. It's interesting to me that this is now my fifth or sixth, if, if you count the book that I rewrote <laughs> almost from scratch for a second edition. That's just why um, if any of your listeners are wondering, she doesn't even know how many books she's written. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have had a different process, so it's not as though I, I have a standard template that is tried and trusted and I, I just keep redeploying for, from one project to the next. But in in this case, uh, and this ha turned out to be very fortunate given uh, the way in which COVID came along two years ago. And if I were not essentially finished with my research at that point, I would have found it almost impossible to, to write the book. And I actually wrote the bulk of the book, about 80% of the book, during the first very long lockdown. So it was written with uncommon speed uh, for me. And, and I think I was able to write it with uncommon speed, in part because I was locked in like everyone else in Britain, except for our one permitted hour out, unless you were in number 10 down a street, in which case you were <laughs> allowed to party and do whatever. Um, but I will not divert us into a political um, conversation. But I, I, so I, having done all the research, I, I sort of sat down and tried to make sense of it and think hard about how th this book would work best. And, and of course, one of the things that I was grappling with it most earnestly was the fact that, of course, uh, I simply didn't find a plethora of Dear John letters in the archives. And, and that's, of course, also one of the largest epiphanies of my my research process was to figure out, well, of course, you know, naive me even thinking that I would find perhaps, you know, any very sizable number of Dear John letters in the archives, because these, it doesn't take too much reflection to, to realize are, are not the letters that their recipients lovingly cling on to and or later bequeath to an archive. So I ended up writing a book that's um, very much about storytelling itself, which is interesting, of course, given that that's what we are here talking about. So the book in large part is about everything that swirls around the phenomenon of, of women writing letters to end relationships with, with deployed servicemen. And a large portion of, of the book is about the stories that men in uniform veterans have had to tell about those letters. So I think it was perhaps more challenging than it has been in, in some of my other books to, to actually figure out what a good way of organizing this material would be to sort of capture the layers of 
very anxious and fraught feeling that surround the Dear John letter, this thing that's both um, ubiquitous in popular culture and veterans storytelling, but almost entirely absent from the archives. So how is I going to deal with this absent presence? And the way I resolved that was to, to place at the center of the book the chapter that, that really foregrounds veterans um, and servicemen and, and their oral tradition of, of the Dear John letter. And then I decided that in sort of onion-like fashion, I would wrap the other layers of, of sort of um, experience of anxiety of both military and civilian concern around everything to do with romantic intimacy and its fragility in wartime around that kernel. So that's how the book took shape. When you're researching this, Susan, and, and you said that you did a uh, vast amount of research before you actually started writing the book, um, you know, going from this uh, kind of pop, pop culture idea that we have about Dear John letters and, uh, in, in, you know, and I'm just thinking back every case of a Dear John letter I can think of, it, it seems to be kind of uh, very one dimensional. Um, did you learn things uh, during the research for this that that took you by surprise? Um, were, were there things that, um, you know, that you thought to yourself, wow, I, I, that that never occurred to me or, or, you know, what what were some of the surprising things uh, in your research? Well, I'm glad you asked me that because there were, there were tons of surprising things. Um, some of them were, were surprising in, in in ways that were unexpected in terms of the emotional register, shall we say, of, of Dear John's storytelling. So I, I think I, I had definitely not expected to find such a rich and deep vein of humor amongst GI stories and, and veteran stories. Um, because uh, as you suggest yourself a, a few moments ago, when we think about the, the standard template of, of the Dear John and how it's plunked down into a movie or, or the many other places that Dear John, the Dear John motif occurs and recurs in popular cultural terms, it, it is such a stock narrative device. And as, as we were saying, you know, our, our heartstrings are, are played upon, we are entreated to feel tremendous sympathy and or outrage on the part of, of the stricken, stricken recipient of the Dear John, and, and that's about it. And so I think I expected when I started listening to Dear John's stories, and, and the a, a lot of of the, the work of actually listening to stories, I quite literally mean with, with headphones on, so I sat down for for several weeks on a couple of different visits to the Veterans History Project at, at the Library of Congress. I listened to other veterans stories. So I was, you know, thinking I wasn't just reading words on a page. I was listening hard to the register and tenor of the story, the, the sort of timbre of the voice, how and where in an oral history that that other people had, had made and recorded with veterans, where was the Dear John story going to pop up? Um, how would it be told? What did I think the, the storyteller was, was hoping to achieve? What kind of emotional reaction was he was he hoping to elicit in, in sharing that particular moment of, of his wartime experience? And, and so I, I really was taken aback to, to find how often Dear John's stories weren't actually angry or aggrieved. They were often very funny, comical stories. Um, I did not <laughs> expect to laugh out loud in in the archives, which uh, fortunately at the Veterans History Project, they, they, they are very congenial uh, and they were not in any way eager to shush me when I was inappropriately chuckling <laughs> over uh, a veteran's testimony. And, and and that was not at all what I what I expected, but in the book, I, I sort of explore this rec recuperative dimension of, of Dear John story sharing that that I, I found so intriguing. And, and then sort of flipping in, into a completely different register um, and domain of experience associated with Dear John letters, I was not perhaps expecting to find myself taken into some um, very extreme and, and dark corners of, of human experience. So uh, I, in the penultimate chapters of the book, uh, I deal both with the way in which Dear John letters have been associated with all kinds of um, negative behaviours amongst military personnel, including the commission of atrocity. So I was, I was very taken aback and, and disturbed to find that 
on at least one occasion, quite literally, a Dear John letter functioned as a get out of jail free card for a Marine who'd been court martialed for his role in, in the unlawful killing of Vietnamese civilians. Um, that definitely took me aback. And as you know, the final chapter of the book deals with, again, some some very distressing and challenging material about the connections that have been drawn for many decades now between Dear John Letters and and lethal self-harm and, and escalating rates of suicide in the military. So um, I, the, the book covers a tremendous range of of human experience and the stories that I was encountering were told in many different registers and the 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 associated behaviors and experiences tied up with the dear John are tremendously varied and I certainly had not expected that. Dear John, Love and Loyalty in Wartime America is available everywhere now. You can grab it at your local bookstore. We're also going to have links in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon uh, as well if you prefer uh, to get it that way. Uh, Susan, this this book just completely uh, challenged everything that I thought I knew uh, about um, this topic, and and you present it in such a engaging and and fascinating way i i learned something and i had uh, at times fun uh with the material sometimes i felt grieved and uh it it, it was it, just a, a fantastic exploration uh of a topic that that you know i i didn't know that i needed to know more about and and those are the best um if, if people are just discovering you and all this fantastic work that that you have done and are continuing to do, where can they find you online if they want to follow along with you? Okay, well, they can find me on my personal website, which is susanlcarruthers.com. So there aren't too many Susan Carruthers out there. <laughs> Although, weirdly, I, I gave a, a talk back in October at a, a, a local history festival, and a woman came up to me and said, I'm Susan Carruthers, too. And <laughs> neither of <laughs> us had even met someone with the same surname, let alone a, a doppelganger with the identical first and last same names. That's fantastic. Uh, but I think your listeners will, will quickly find the, the correct, as it were, Susan Carruthers. Um, the L is the all-important middle initial. And my my website has a, a large image of the Dear John book jacket cover, so that there will be no mistaking it. But, but Hank, I have to say, um, it makes me so, so delighted as an author to, to hear the words that you just said about your own emotional response to the book. It, it, as an author, you, you only sometimes get to find out who's responded to the stuff that you put out there in the world and, and you're left often to wonder, well, how did it resonate with, with readers? Did it resonate? What what kinds of, of chords did it strike? So to hear that it it, it moved you perhaps to, to laughter, as, <laughs> to laughter as, as well as, as more sober emotions at other moments is just such a, a big thrill. And, and thank you for, for sharing that with me. Well, thank you for uh, producing a book that that, you know, in engages us in this way. Um, I think people are going to love it. Uh, I'm recommending this book uh, to everyone that I meet. Uh, Dear John, available everywhere now. Grab it from the show notes of the episode or run down to your local bookstore, pick up a copy. Susan, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you. It's really been my pleasure. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. They made instant coffee and laid blankets over a pile of hay. He helped Kate pull off her boots. She volunteered for first watch, but Jason couldn't sleep. Talk to me, he whispered. Kate sipped her coffee. She sat silhouetted against the soft navy sky. A field of stars hung above her. The constellations peered in through the windows and slats. How about a story? Sure. My mom used to tell this one. It's the legend of the Star Maidens. He watched her words as she spoke, her story illustrated by puffs of vapor that mixed with the steam of her coffee. Long ago, a Mohican brave became lost in this valley. He'd followed a red deer deep into the woods, but the deer had vanished, and as twilight fell, he lost his way. He searched the heavens. He saw a bright star and followed it. 
It shone upon a clearing in the woods. Spook rock lay at the center, emanating magic. And in the starlight, he discovered the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He discovered a star maiden. She was dancing with her sisters, and all seven were naked. Oh, really? Jason whispered. Seven naked star maidens? Shh. Why do these things never happen to me? The brave decided he must take the star maiden for his wife, so he seized her and threw her over his shoulder, and she loved him for his courage. They married and had a son. Then what? Then it gets sad. The star maiden missed her home. She gazed at the sky every night. She loved her husband and her baby very much, but she missed her sisters, and she especially missed the dancing. So she snuck away one night and returned to the sacred rock, and she begged her sisters, please appear, please appear to me for one last dance. They came to her and took her into the sky. Kate's silhouette swayed. One last dance. It was wonderful. And when the dance was finished, they sent her back to earth. She thought that she'd been away for only a little while. But that one dance had taken many, many years. She ran back to her husband, back to her baby. But they were gone. Her home was empty. The hunter had stopped waiting for her. He'd given up hope that she would return. He'd taken their child and had left with his tribe. One last dance had cost her everything, and she had no home at all. Jason could sense something roiling inside Kate, some brew of feelings that the story had stirred. He wanted to leap up, to grab her and carry her off, his star maiden, and wife. She climbed up to Spook Rock. She heard no music, only wind. She died there of her grief. She dwindled and lost her star form. She became a will-o'-the-wisp, fluttering between the trees. And see that constellation? The Pleiades. Those are her seven sisters, watching down from heaven. And, to this day, if a girl has lost her true love, she can go to Spook Rock and dance, and the star maidens will bless her. They'll grant her one wish, any wish at all, except one. They can't make her true love return.